it's connecting. Oh, it's okay, okay, I see it's recording. So Excellent. Mm -hmm. Well, welcome, everybody. Um, my name is Elaine Holland. I'm Harmony Hill's Executive Director, and we're delighted you can join us this evening for the first of our series of four sessions on nutrition. Um, and you'll see tonight we're talking about the key principles of a cancer prevention diet. Dr. Deanna Minich, who is our um, uh, presenter this evening has her doctorate in nutrition. If you've not met Deanna, you'll know she's just a, a wonderful combination of both being, both being both somebody who knows a tremendous amount about nutrition, but is able to put it into very practical, usable terms. So we get both the theoretical as well as the practical from, from Dr. Minich. A um, couple of things before we get going. You'll notice, uh, for those of you online, if you put your cursor up on that green bar at the top of the display, you, you'll you see a little drop-down menu, and if you, if you click on participants, that will give you access to doing chatting and raising your hand if you have a question, um, and, and in the sense, interact with Deanna. Um, secondly, I wanted to mention, this is the first of four sessions, and for the next four Sundays at 6, you can please join us. If you haven't signed up yet, go ahead and, and uh, register for those sessions. If you do happen to miss one, they are posted on our website for your review. And then finally, um, based on feedback from our July series, we are changing the format a little bit. We're making two changes. One, uh, we'll have a 20-minute lecture session, and then after 20 minutes, we're going to pause and see if you have any questions. Um, for a t about a 10-minute Q&A, and then Deanna will go into another 20-minute session and another 10 minutes towards the end of the session for your questions to try to make it a little bit more interactive. Um, and then the second change we've made is that when you log out this evening, you'll see that the survey will pop up. This will give us more instant feedback instead of waiting to the end of all four sessions to get your feedback. We uh, really value your opinions and we'll continue to make adjustments according to what you have to say, because we are our objective is to be as helpful as possible. Harmony Hill's mission is to transform the lives of those affected by cancer and inspire healthy living for all. And we're doing that both in the um, form of a three-day cancer retreat at Harmony Hill, remote one-day sessions, as well as these um, nutrition series. So with that, Deanna, I will turn it over to you uh, for this evening's session talking about a cancer prevention diet. Great. Well, thank you, Elaine. Um, I really appreciate the, the kind introduction, and I'd like to thank Harmony Hill for sponsoring this webinar series. Again, uh, Harmony Hill has been so gracious with providing nutrition information uh, to people at uh, their retreats and also to the to the, to the general public, so it's uh, quite a gift, and I'm really honored to present this information. So this is the, the first webinar in the series, and tonight we're going to be talking about key principles of a cancer prevention diet. And as we go into all of these webinars, I, I do want to note for all of you that uh, if you do have cancer or um, are under treatment um, by a physician, that uh, you really need to take that as first and foremost uh, with, with respect to um, advice and guidance, and that what I'm presenting here tonight is more for your educational purpose. And if there's something here that's intriguing, please talk about it with your physician and uh, decide on the best course of treatment. So what we're going to do tonight uh, are basically two things, especially since uh, we're, we're going to try out this new format of, of kind of uh, doing the lecture for 20 minutes and then moving into Q&A. So the, the first part is we will learn and talk about what processes in the body are important to cancer. And in fact, we're going to revisit those processes each time we come back for the, the webinar because they are essential to, to realize. And if you can have an understanding of those processes, then everything else becomes quite intuitive with respect to lifestyle. The other part that we're going to focus on is um, 
looking at five different principles of a cancer prevention diet. Now, you know, uh, as well as I do, that I can probably give you a laundry list of different things to do with respect to um, preventing cancer occurrence through food. But what we're going to focus on tonight, as Elaine said, we want to make this very practical and not inundate you with too much information. So we're going to focus on five basic things that you can take away and start tomorrow if you wanted. So um, I would highly recommend, if you're really interested in uh, cancer prevention or even um, looking a little bit deeper into the process of cancer and what you can do about it, there's a wonderful book called Five to Thrive. It's by Dr. Lise Alshuler um, and Carolyn Gazella. They did a wonderful job of um, putting together a very patient, consumer-friendly book on what you can do um, to, to help ward off cancer. And Harmony Hill does carry this book. So a lot of the material that I have in this uh, presentation is really drawn from, from this, this book. It's, it's quite a resource. So one of the, um, the things that we're learning tonight is the, the five pathways that directly influence our health. And these are the five body systems or the five processes within the body that we are hoping to, to change through food and through lifestyle. Of course, um, I'm sure all of you recognize the importance of the immune system. I almost see the immune system as an internal army uh, against external uh, offenders and invaders. And so our immune system, if it's working well, it's developing a memory for uh, some type of antigen or something that's foreign so that it can respond even better the next time that it sees that. It also circulates within the lymphatic system and the extracellular fluid. So basically a lot of the, the fluid compartments of the body carry the immune system, as does the bone marrow. And as we will be addressing in subsequent webinars, there's so much that you can do to help the immune system with, uh, with respect to your, your food, your activity, and uh, your, just even looking at how you manage stress. Inflammation is another one of the pathways, and in fact, um, as we start talking about cancer prevention, one of the things to do is really to focus on what reduces inflammation. And when we think of inflammation, the key words that come up in the medical literature are color, dolor, rubor. So that would be heat, pain, and redness, and even going further into tumor, which would be swelling uh, or a mass. So um, what tends to happen, there's kind of a unique relationship between the immune system and inflammation. So when the immune system is activated, um, that could be because of some inflammation in the body. Also, just through the normal course of aging, um, there's a new term in, in science that talks about the underlying inflammation that happens. And uh, what we know is that inflammation is really um, at the core of many of the cancer processes. So it's really important to get inflammation under check, and we'll be talking about how food does that. Hormonal balance um, is also key. Um, and as you can see here, these are small cartoons of the different glands in the body, the different endocrine glands that are responsible for releasing hormones and sending those messengers throughout the body for a number of different functions. Everything from balancing your blood sugar, which would come from uh, the pancreas, uh, also, your immune response, looking at the thymus, which resides in, uh, in the, the upper chest area. And also the stress response, if you think of um, the adrenals. So we will be talking definitely about hormone balance. And as you probably know, many cancers do involve hormones. Um, and some of them are um, actually growing in the presence of certain hormones. The other pathway is insulin resistance. As we talk about food, it's so important to understand um, how your body processes sugar uh, because cancer cells do require sugar for energy. And, in fact, they like to really um, hoard a lot of the sugar that comes into the body. So if your body is not receptive to insulin, cancer cells which have insulin receptors will start to take up sugar, all the sugar that your body's not able to take up and start to grow the cancer. So the role of sugar in the diet is essential and that will be one of the things that we talk about tonight. That's one of the probably the the one thing that I have the the most passion about <laughs> um, as we go further. And then the last uh, pathway that we'll be revisiting throughout this, this series of webinars is that of digestion and detoxification. 
I like to think that um, all of these are important. However, this one um, holds a special place in my, my mind because uh, so much of our health is determined by how well we are processing and excreting. So at some point we will be talking about what you can do to help promote healthy gut function. And that will come through our discussion about the different foods as well. So what kinds of foods um, can help heal the pathways? That's what we want to be focusing on. What can help heal the immune system? What can help reduce inflammation? How do we get our hormones in balance? How do we get digestion and elimination um, in check? And how do we get um, insulin working better in our, in our body? Well, of course, um, I think many of you are on this call because you are aware of the role of lifestyle uh, as it relates to cancer. And as you can see here, this was a um, um, basically looking at all the different factors that are involved with cancer. And you can see that uh, for the most part, diet plays a role of about 30 to 35 percent. So it doesn't mean that um, that diet is the only uh, factor that leads to cancer. There are certain cancers that have more of a role um, in certain cancers than others. But you can see that um, there are other issues here as well to observe. So food, uh, that brings us to um, really getting at the core of looking at what are we eating. Um, and there are lots of different ways to look at food nowadays. Um, I've worked with the, the group that, that really studies functional medicine, and there, there is this whole doctrine of food being medicine. We're starting to realize the power of food to signal messages to our genes. So some of these genes can be turned on or turned off, and that could be helpful or harmful, depending on the food, as it relates to cancer. Food is also um, about connection, and I don't want to let that slide by, because really if you think of the ability of us to connect through our social networks, through community functions that involve eating, it's very much a unifying act that has a lot of emotional impact on us. So you might be on the call tonight because you're thinking, well, I'm really confused. What should I eat? There are so many diet books out there, and I just want to get to the, the essence here. I just want the takeaways. Well, before we get into the, the five basic principles, I just want to tell you a quick story because maybe this will in part uh, tell you something about the insight we can get from another person's life and their lifestyle as it relates to cancer. Uh, this is, uh, you'll see a man on the screen. This is um, Stomatis Moritis, and uh, he, in this picture right here, he claims to be 102 years old. Um, but there are <laughs> his uh, uh, a record states that he might be 97. So, regardless, he he's uh, he's well up there. He's a centenarian, and um, he is. A quite an interesting individual and was interviewed by Dan Buettner who did a lot of work on the blue zones talking about what helps people to be healthy what helps people to live long and have a good quality of life so Stamatis um, had come over from an island in Greece which was his native homeland to the United States when he was just 35 and this was right after World War II and uh, he just sought a, a different experience. He ended up marrying a Greek-American woman, had three children, ended up in Florida. And 30 years later, at the age of 65, he was diagnosed with cancer. In fact, the, the prognosis from his physician was that he would probably only survive about nine months. So Stamatis thought, well, I'd like to go back home. Uh, I, I know that funerals are expensive, and I want to have more money for my family, and I want to have uh, my remaining days uh, with my friends and, and my, my extended family. So Stamatis returned to Icaria, which is the island that he's from uh, in Greece. And um, essentially, for the first couple of months, uh, he just lived a very relaxed life. He was thinking that uh, he probably wouldn't be alive too much longer. And so he was eating uh, these types of foods that you see on the screen, lots of whole foods and uh, even some red wine and playing dominoes way into the, the wee hours of the morning with his friends. And lo and behold, at nine months, uh, he found himself still alive. In fact, it, not only was he alive, but he had more energy than he had had in a very long time. 
So um, the picture that I showed you of him shows that even though he was diagnosed with cancer at 65, he was able to surpass and to go beyond that um, through his lifestyle. So lots of different things that you're seeing here in this picture, um, things like whole grains, things like even dried herbs, which are spices, things like chestnuts, things like vegetables, and um, some pure olive oil, just to name a few. So I tell you that uh, story because sometimes a lot of this information feels far removed, but I want you to have a glimmer of hope and to know that um, living well through lifestyle and through food uh, is is quite possible and it's within your reach. So um, according to Dr. Alshuler, I really like uh, what she says here about a cancer prevention diet. What should it have as its baseline characteristics? Well, number one, you definitely want to be sure that you've got some science behind what you're doing. Absolutely. You know, there are a lot of different fringe type of protocols and such, but, um, you know, number two, they may not be sustainable. They may not give you the outcome that you're looking for because, number one, they haven't been studied, so you don't really know about the efficacy. And they may be so fringe and so difficult to follow that you can't really keep doing it for a long period of time. So keep in mind that those small changes are going to make a large impact. And then thirdly, the type of food that you're eating should be supportive of the five key pathways that we talked about. So helping the immune system, helping to reduce inflammation, helping with the hormone balance, helping with insulin and glucose in your body, and lastly, helping with digestion and detoxification. So let's dive into the five key principles. Um, I have them up here, and we're going to take these individually going through each one. And I think probably we'll address the first one before we'll have some time for questions. So cancer um, likes excess fat. So whatever you choose to do um, in terms of your eating, um, you might want to think about maintaining your ideal body weight. So um, that, that would be a, a definite goal if you're trying to, to prevent cancer and also even um, uh, to help if you do have cancer and you are overweight or obese. In fact, as you can see here, obesity is responsible for one in six cancer deaths in the United States. And if you look at this statistic for breast cancer, being overweight more than doubles the risk of dying. Um, and also for prostate cancer, um, being obese increases the chance of dying by 34%. So our current Western diet does promote excess weight if we are thinking of uh, the standard highly processed uh, way of eating, lots of refined sugar, lots of simple carbohydrates, unhealthy fat, and more animal products than plant products. So what are some of the things that you can do to ensure healthy body weight? Well, one easy thing uh, to gauge is to check your, your hunger level. Now note um, that I'm not talking about how full are you, but how is your hunger before you start to eat and after you eat? In fact, um, for some people that are really out of touch with their body, what you can do is um, just even objectively give yourself a rating before you start eating. And what you really want to come to at the end of that meal is not somewhere between a 6 and a 10, which would bring you more towards being painfully full or just having that feeling of, of uncomfort, discomfort. So you really do want to be in the category of being satisfied. It's almost like what the Japanese say, harahachibu, eating until you are no longer hungry or until about 80% fullness. Now, the other thing to note is um, are you eating, and this is very common. I know it's a funny picture, but it's to get at the fact of many times we're eating because of our emotions. It's not because our body requires energy. It's because we're trying to stuff down emotion or trying to uh, self-medicate with certain foods that will help us to feel blissed out and, and kind of give us that sense of um, ease as it relates to an emotion. So being physically hungry means actually having a physical sensation in your body that you need to eat. So you might feel some hunger pains in the stomach. Um, emotional hunger usually comes on the heels of some type of an emotional event. 
and it doesn't tend to stop even when one is full. So checking in with yourself to see whether or not you're eating because of emotions or because your body is requiring the energy is really key. In fact, what I notice with a lot of patients is that they eat because they're bored. So, you know, that's not necessarily emotional hunger, um, but you want to make sure that the reason you're eating is because you need to um, have that sustenance. So there are lots of different aspects of, uh, of eating, and I see we've got about one minute before we go into questions, so let me just finish this slide here. Um, you know, even though we're going to be talking about what to eat and nutrition, and I, I don't want you to um, become paralyzed um, by all of the analysis of the information. I think it's really important to savor, to cultivate, and to address the art of eating. You know, I think that many of us have gotten away from enjoying food. We've really gone down the path of lots of stress. Eating has become functional. Sometimes we forget to eat. Sometimes we overeat because we're not in tune. We're not mindfully eating. But by engaging our senses, in fact, uh, just last night I gave a talk on spices, and I'm going to be featuring a spice webinar through Harmony Hill in 2013. But spices are just one easy thing to start implementing because they connect into our senses, which helps to uh, get our digestive tract ready for the meal, and it actually helps us to better digest um, the food that we're taking in. So I don't want us to go through the eating experience in a way that's not enjoyable. So why don't I pause there um, since it's 620 and just open up for any questions that anybody might have. Um, <clears throat> Deanna, I see jo Joanne Munson's raised her hand. I don't know. Can you um, unmute her line? Do you know how to do that? Yes. Let me just. Okay, she should be unmuted now. Can you hear me? We can. Yes. Hi, Joanne. Hi. Actually, what I was saying is um, I'm trying to take notes, and you're going so fast I can't keep up. Oh. <laughs> so is there any way to slow down? For example, I saw a bunch of R's that were about the um, maintenance of the gut, and I thought, ooh, that's good information, but I couldn't type them fast enough. <laughs> Yeah, well, two things. Um, I can slow down, but keep in mind that this, you can go as slow as you want um, if you want to actually watch the recording because we do have a lot of information, and all of this will be made available to you at the end uh, through the recording. So okay. that might be helpful. So you can, you know, really listen and, and take notes. You can listen to it repeatedly if you'd like. Excellent. Thank you. Sure. If anyone else has a question, there's a little hand icon in the participant bar that you can just tap on that, and that's how Joanna was, Joanne was able to indicate she had a question. Um, while we're waiting to see if there's any other questions, Deanna, I'll ask um, what, something we talked about last time. Since sugar is so hard, you know, bad for us. Can you say a few things about ways to break that addiction to sugar that some of us may have? Yes. Um, also, I want to mention that Eric has a, a question, too, so we'll oh, address okay, that. Oh, okay, great. Um, well, maybe we should I, I'm unmute going to, Yeah, let me just address your question quickly, and then I'll unmute Eric, and he can ask his. Okay. Um, I do have a separate section on sugar, but to speak to sugar addiction, which is very, very common, um, moving away from the processed forms of sugar and moving into whole food forms of sugar is one way that um, I tend to do that with patients. So, and it takes some time. It takes about seven to ten days to reset your palate. So if you can be pretty disciplined for about a week trying to taper off a lot of the processed sugar sources and move into whole food sources like an apple or a banana, even though a banana is higher glycemic, um, it, it has other phytonutrients and other goodies in it that you wouldn't find necessarily with a product with processed um, sugar. So taking it in stages. So if you just take a can of Coke and you want to move away from Coke, moving into something like a, um, uh, an Izzy's drink, uh, which is kind of a bubbly drink that has much less sugar, and that's I-Z-Z-E. -E. It's a, a, a brand name. There's a, there are also other ones like Zevia, 
which is a bubbly drink as well, or you can take some juice with seltzer water and put that in there. So, um, But I would say just do a slow, gradual easing away, and you'll start noticing that even an apple starts to taste really sweet. So should we move on to Eric? Yes, absolutely. Okay. Eric, Hello. do you have a you question? Yes, I can. I'm, I'm just wondering, is it possible to get the slides of this information? You will have the recording, um, but not necessarily the, the actual slides um, to, as a download. But you definitely will have the recording and will have the information on those slides. Okay. Thank you very much. Sure. And we also have Sarah who has a question. I know Sarah. Hi. Hi Sarah. Can you hear me? Yes, Hi. I can. Hi. So uh, you, you may be going into this later, but um, uh, actually my, my husband was asking over my shoulder. Um, when you have um, inflammation issues, he says, well, I, I know when I you know hurt my ankle and it's inflamed, but what about other sort of internal inflammation? How, how can you tell if you've got inflammation issues in other parts of your body? Yes, that is a very, very good question because sometimes we don't even know that certain things are inflamed. Um, one of the common sources of inflammation, and again, it's think of rubor, color, and dolor. So looking at anything that's hot, where you have pain in the body, there's swelling, um, there, there's temperature change of some sort. That would be kind of the outward sign. So let's imagine that, um, uh, you know, typically many people have a lot of um, issues in the mouth, kind of underlying infections um, in teeth, and so that's why going in for regular checkups um, at the dentist might be a very, very good idea. In fact, um, there was a study even showing that flossing your teeth every other day, and I would hope that people are doing that every day, uh, but it can help to reduce the amount of inflammation by 50% um, overall, a, a marker in the blood called C-reactive protein. So really important to be looking and paying attention to things that are painful, things that are red, things that are swollen, uh, and if not necessarily um, seeing those things, looking at changes in your body function. So is there a change in your stool habits? Are you more constipated? Are you having more diarrhea? Um, making sure that you make time for um, those, those annual checkups and visits to assess the functioning of your organs if you're not noticing anything blatant. So I think that those would be some of the, the general ways. But, yeah, um, you know, if you're not – uh, experiencing an injury, many times it's not always easy to tell. But um, for many people, they've got some underlying pain or um, some some general issues that um, they're they're well aware of. Does that help, okay, Sarah? Mm -hmm. Okay. So we've got about three more minutes before we head back into the material. I, I don't see don't any other it. questions, so since you've got so much material, should we just go ahead and get started, and then sure. it, as we go through, again, feel free to just hit the hand button, and we'll address it in the, towards the end. How does that sound, Deanna? That sounds great. Okay. All right, um, and I know I, I'm kind of moving through this quickly, and, you know, this is more conversational, right, whenever we do webinars, and Again, you're free to listen to this as many times as you'd like afterwards, and you can get the video on the Harmony Hill website. So we are talking about making sure that you, you stay at your ideal body weight. So what I'm doing here is giving you different strategies to uh, enable you to do that more effectively. So another really good gauge, um, I learned this from a naturopathic physician in Australia by the name of Damien Christoph, who talked about how when you put your two hands together, um, what you learn um, is that this is essentially about the size of the stomach. So if you're eating more than two hands worth at any one meal, it's not that your stomach can't stretch, but you would be potentially overloading um, your digestive tract. So, in fact, I like this idea so much that I even, for myself, got a bowl from the store which was round and, and shaped almost like putting two hands together so that I can better assess when I'm eating at home uh, the amount of food that I'm eating. There are also a lot of things in our environment that are going to influence how much we're eating. 
So if we're eating mindlessly, like if we're watching television, that could make us eat more. So when you're eating, in fact, I just returned from Taiwan last weekend, and what I noticed about how people eat there versus in the U.S. is that when people are eating, they're eating. You see them at the table. They're almost not engaged in conversation. Their head is down. They're eating their meal. Uh, you can tell that they're savoring it, that they're very um, into the experience. And I think um, in the U.S., we tend to be distracted. We might be doing dashboard dining, meaning we're eating in the car, we're eating at our desk, we're eating in front of the computer. So what you may want to do is implement some things to slow you down or to make you more mindful. Just have some general rules like no eating while you're watching television. You know, that's a real basic one. You can also um, eat with chopsticks. That can help you to slow down your eating by 20 to 30%, and that's if you don't normally use chopsticks. And then also um, changing your serving ware sizes. So um, even in my household, uh, what we did is we moved away from large plates, and you'll notice that even at restaurants, plates are becoming larger, silverware is becoming gigantic, So what if we downscale that and eat from appetizer plates, right? So you have that under your locus of control in your own household. And then if you are at a restaurant, you can um, split meals or you can take things home. Uh, One wonderful strategy from a patient that I was um, uh, learning from him was that when he would order something at a restaurant and saw how gigantic the portion was as soon as it arrived to his table, he straightaway asked the waitress to box half of it up so he would not feel inclined to overeat. Great. So I spent a lot of time on that first one, but I think it's it's pretty important because, again, cancer does feed off of excess uh, fat. And excess fat, so Sarah, you asked about what denotes inflammation. Well, typically if somebody is overweight or obese, that already inherently um, suggests that there is inflammation in the body. The The fat tissue itself makes inflammatory cytokines. It's a very active material. It's not inert. It doesn't just sit on us. It's very active. So by getting ourselves into normal body weight, we can also help to reduce some of that inflammation. All right, so number two is to eat a colorful diet, and this is not one I'm going to go into too much because I think that this is pretty intuitive. Um, And, you know, I say here, eat the rainbow. And what I'd like you to do, if you're really keen on just taking even one of these and really sticking to it, and this is the one that you feel most inclined towards, what I would say is keep track of what you eat on a daily basis. So just get a notebook, start writing down the things that you're eating, and then take, at the end of the day, take markers or crayons and just draw a colored line through each of the foods to represent the color of the food and see what colors you might be missing. It's very typical, 88% of people miss blue-purple compounds. Blue-purple, things like blueberries, things like grapes, things like um, uh, dates, or especially when it comes to cancer, I think of the berries. They're very, um, they're loaded with lots of anti-cancer substances. So I'm uh, showing on the screen now, this is from the Institute of Functional Medicine. Um, So this is uh, an educational uh, facility that really um, goes out and educates doctors. So um, I've used their phytonutrient spectrum to show you how each of the different categories of color are associated with different foods. And these foods have certain benefits. So let's imagine that you're always eating red foods, red colored fruits and vegetables. Well, that'll be very good for certain things. Um, A lot of red foods are anti-cancer. A lot of them are anti-inflammatory. They protect your cells. But you might be missing some, if you're just focusing on red and you're not getting yellow, you may not be getting the lutein, which helps with Uh, reducing the incidence of age-related macular degeneration. You actually need that yellow compound for the back of the eye for your vision. So each of these colors represents not just the pigment and the color, but also the function. And these, these phytonutrients are used in different body systems. 
The third one is uh, to eat a whole foods diet. And again, I think that this is pretty intuitive too. I don't need to uh, expound on what are whole foods, but I thought just for the sake of clarification, we should just get this out on the table and uh, make it clear. So legumes, um, any type of, of bean, uh, if we're thinking kidney beans, um, uh, red beans, black beans, white beans, gosh, there are so many, garbanzo beans, um, things like hummus. And, um, you know, I'm not thinking of a lot of the beans in their processed forms per se, but um, as close to their natural whole form as possible. Whole grains, things that have not been polished, like um, whether it's white polished rice where you've removed, where the, um, uh, the food manufacturer has removed the outer layer of bran, which provides fiber. Things like fruits and vegetables. So again, I think that this is pretty intuitive, and many of these foods, not always, but if you go into your average grocery store, you're going to find many of these whole foods hovering at um, uh, essentially the perimeter of the grocery store. Okay, I'm just noticing here, um, I, my phone is a little bit low on battery. I'm just going to shift in a second. So I am also providing the, the Dirty Dozen and the Clean 15. So these are foods, um, fruits and vegetables, especially if you are focusing on fruits and vegetables as whole foods, you want to be um, sure that you're getting foods that are organically grown versus conventionally grown. So, um, and that doesn't have to be for all foods. There are some foods that may require that uh, more than others. So just a second, I'm going to, okay. All right. Elaine, can you hear me okay? I had to unmute. Yes, we can hear you. This is fine. Okay, yeah. very good. Sorry for that. Sorry for having to shift the phone. Okay, so I really like this Environmental Working Group's um, Shopper's Guide. Uh, if you go on their website at ewg.org, you can uh, just print this off for yourself, also at foodnews.org. All right, uh, the next um, principle, and this one I might spend a little bit more on, a little bit more time on, uh, and this is looking at plant versus animal sources of fat and protein. So um, being that meat consumption, especially red meat consumption, is connected to um, greater rates of certain types of cancers, I thought it would be worthwhile to address this. So we need fat. Um, <laughs> this is uh, so important, and many people think that they shouldn't eat fat and that it's going to make them fat, but some of these fats are essential, so we definitely need to get them in the diet. Uh, we need them for our brain. Sixty percent of our, our brain matter is fat, um, and so that will influence our behavior if we don't have enough fats in the brain. Um, our eye health. So the, the back of the eye, the retina, um, needs, in order for good, healthy vision, we need to have certain types of fats in the body. Um, everything that you see on the outside of your body, um, the skin and nails primarily, is connected to uh, the type of fat that you take in. And in fact, in um, some of the early 1940s work with animals, when they took fat out of their diet, some of the first things that they noticed was scaly um, skin, scaly tail, and that their fur was falling out. So really important to have fat for the integrity of the skin and the, the cell uh, membrane. We need fat also to absorb uh, fat-soluble vitamins, so vitamins like vitamin A, vitamin D, vitamin E, and vitamin K. And even um, the beta-carotene, the orange-colored compound in carrots, when you're eating that, um, if you don't have a little bit of oil or some type of fat, you won't be absorbing much of the beta carotene. So really important uh, as a vehicle for the absorption of vitamins. Uh, the nervous system, the, the actual nerves themselves are coated with a myelin sheath, kind of a protective outer layer that is um, very fat rich. So there are certain chronic conditions that are um, connected to the, the degradation of that sheath and, and then you get all kinds of issues and the, the, the nerves stop functioning well. Um, what I'm going to focus on is the connection to inflammation specifically. 
So there are certain fats that are anti-inflammatory and certain ones that are a little bit more inflammatory. But it's not that you um, need to avoid the fats that are inflammatory. It's more important that you balance the ratio between anti-inflammatory and inflammatory fats. So what does that mean? Well, uh, let's just look at this, this schematic a little bit here. So this is uh, referring to all the different types and, and classifications of fat. You see coming down from the top um, a division between saturated fat and unsaturated fat. A unsaturated fat, um, these fats are typically liquids and oils. So they're liquid at room temperature. And then if you divide those up further, you have certain fats that are called polyunsaturated fat. And under polyunsaturated fat, this is where I want to um, have a little bit of focus. So we have the omega-3 fats. And these are thought to be more the anti-inflammatory fats. So you'll see this long name here, eicosapentaenoic acid. This is also known as EPA. If you are taking a, an omega-3 or fish oil supplement, chances are it has certain amounts of EPA. And that's what you find from fish and shellfish. The other omega-3 fatty acid that's very good for helping to reduce inflammation is called docosahexaenoic acid, or DHA. And that's another one that you'd find in a fish oil supplement. EPA and DHA you will also find in um, the actual food sources, so things like fish. And some people say, well, what happens if I don't eat fish? Well, if you don't eat fish, um, then you have to make sure that you're getting some of the, uh, the other omega-3 fatty acid, which hopefully will convert in your body once you eat it to the EPA and DHA. So some of those foods are like flaxseed, um, walnuts, rapeseed oil. Um, I'm not as big of a fan as, of the rapeseed, but leafy green vegetables uh, and flaxseed. Flaxseed oil, not the flaxseed itself because you'd have to actually crush it and expose the oil because that's on the inside. But the flaxseed oil is a good source of that alpha-linolenic acid, which once you take it into your body, it can convert into these other very active, very anti-inflammatory fats known as EPA and DHA. Now, the problem has been um, that in our food supply, we've kind of overdone it on things like corn oil, safflower oil, and sunflower oil, and I would add even in there soybean oil. Um, and because of those, those four oils, we tend to get more in the way of omega-6 fats than we do in the way of omega-3 fats. And when we have too much omega-6 to omega-3, this will move the body more towards inflammation. If we have more omega-3 or a balanced level of the omega-3 and omega-6, this is a very good thing. Then we don't have uh, an out-of-balance uh, inflammatory system. Now, I'll just mention very quickly before we move on, um, the omega-9 fats, these are fats that can be made in the body. Um, these fats are things like oleic acid, you know, things that you get from olive oil or avocados, peanuts, and almonds. The omega-3 and omega-6, these are fats that your body cannot make, so you have to get them from food. So that's why we call these essential fatty acids. So the omega-3 and omega-6, those fats that are found in those food sources that you see there are essential. And it's not that omega-6 are bad fats, it's just you want a good balance of the omega-6 to the omega-3. And right now in the U.S. food supply, we have way too much in the way of omega-6. So here are some unsaturated oils that you can choose from. So the, the ones that I highlighted in red are ones that we probably get too much of already. And um, it, it might be good. I like lots of variety. I think it's important to shake things up a bit. Um, if you buy canola, make sure you buy organic. Canola tends to be um, often GMO. So if you buy an organic form of canola, um, that, that's definitely preferred. Um, Cold-pressed 
olive oil that has been unfiltered would be my choice. And keep in mind that all oils should be kept away from heat, light, and oxygen. So you might see some other ones on here that are a little bit more um, esoteric or just not as frequently used, things like hemp seed oil, walnut oil. Some of these are more specialty oils and not to be used for cooking per se, but more for things like salad dressings or even just to put on vegetables. Some of the um, oils like black currant and borage oil, evening primrose oil, these are oils that are typically used for a specific fatty acid, uh, and that fatty acid has been shown to be important in certain skin diseases. So these are, um, this is just a picture of the dietary sources of omega-3s, and again, I, I spoke about those, the green leafy vegetables, the flax seed, um, walnuts tend to be a good source, and I like the fact that a walnut is shaped like a brain, so that it's kind of a reminder that it contains the good, healthy omega-3s for the brain. Some eggs um, are from chickens that have been fed high omega-3 feed, so their eggs tend to be a little bit higher in omega-3s. And I would say it's not too terribly high, but um, yes, definitely a, a better form of an egg, because otherwise chickens are very commonly fed corn feed. Uh, of course, you see a fish there, and if you're not grinding up your flax seeds, you are not getting the oil. In fact, I just saw a ready-to-eat cereal yesterday, and it, they were touting a certain amount of omega-3s in the, in the serving of cereal, but these were whole flax seeds. So in essence, you're not getting those omega-3 fats because pretty much the flax seed will stay intact. It's not, they're, they're very small, so it's not easy to really break them, to have our digestive tract break them apart. All right, uh, and now let's... Um, kind of close and, and talk about um, what you might expect that I might say, which would be to reduce or eliminate refined, processed, and packaged foods. And this is where I say to really stay out of the, the inner aisles of a grocery store, because this is where you're going to find a lot of things in boxes and styrofoam and plastic um, in containers of all sorts. And this usually denotes some type of um, processing. So um, Harmony Hill happens to carry one of my books. It's a small pocket guide. And I wrote this um, because a number of patients were complaining that it's almost like you have to have a separate education just to read a food label. And so uh, I, I designed this to be very easy to use in the grocery store, flipping through, helping to understand, is it good to have citric acid in your food? What is citric acid? So it's a laundry list of different ingredients, a couple of sentences on what it is, why it would be in the food, and then I provide a rating, an A, a B, a C, et cetera. So um, it's very easy to use, and I just thought I would include this because this is where, you know, <laughs> food gets tricky sometimes. And I would say, you know, not only reading your food labels, but also your personal care products. I'd like to do a whole session um, at Harmony Hill next year where we just focus on personal care products, things like lotions and shampoos and toothpaste, the, the things of everyday use that in some ways we, we are ingesting if we have them uh, on our skin. So let's look at a, a nutrition facts label. If we're looking at a processed food here, which is macaroni and cheese, um, the, the Nutrition Facts label gives us lots of information. And as you can see, starting at the top, always looking to see what is the serving size, right? Because um, you want to be aware of the actual amount that has the nutrition that they're stating there. So what I want you to zoom down to, and of course all of this is, infor is very informational and very um, important for you to know, but what I think is really um, one of the, the key features and will come up in my next slide is talking about sugar. And fortunately for this macaroni and cheese, if you look at the sugars, you see five grams. Uh, just from a, a visual perspective, four grams is equal to a sugar cube. Okay, so four grams is equal to a sugar cube. So looking at this, you would say it has a little bit more than a sugar cube in one cup. 
So interesting, right, that there would be sugars. Um, and there might be sugars in this because of also the lactose that might be in the milk that would be contained in this product. So that would that's one disclaimer here. If you look under total carbohydrate um, at 31, that means that this product has lots of starch. And starch can also quickly break down um, in our digestive tract and make its way quickly into the bloodstream, calling forth lots of insulin from our pancreas. And this is where if we're constantly eating lots of high carbohydrate, lots of refined foods, we start to exhaust our pancreas, so to speak. And then our body um, starts to really not recognize um, the, the signal of insulin which brings us back to one of the five key pathways. So sugar comes in many forms, and I think that if you just have one takeaway, and I know that we're coming to a close here, um, just a couple of minutes, make sure you read your labels carefully for sugar because it does come in, in different forms. And what you're going to find is that even healthy products will uh, disguise sugar by calling it uh, evaporated cane juice. And you might think, well, honey, that can't be bad for you. But honey is a moderate glycemic impact sweetener, and it will be processed in the body very similar. In fact, I was at a gathering last night, and they were talking about, well, natural sugar is, is really important uh, and better than processed sugar. Well, natural sugar, what does that mean exactly? Does that mean raw sugar or brown sugar? You know, there are lots of different things here. So my preference when it comes to baking is to stay close to the whole food form. And this speaks to Elaine's question about how do you start weaning yourself off of sugar. Number one, read the labels. Look to see, I mean, even your ketchup, your peanut butter, your ready-to-eat cereal, everything is loaded with sugar. So by starting to minimize and make better choices from the get-go when you're at the grocery store, and then when you're baking at home, some of the things that I do is I'll use mashed up banana, I'll use apple juice concentrate to sweeten uh, baked products, um, orange juice concentrate also works well for certain things. Uh, I might use stevia, and stevia is a, an herb that does not impact the blood sugar. So um, really important, we're always going to be coming back to these different pathways, and we're going to go into them at different um, levels within this webinar series. When we come back uh, next week, we're going to be talking about toxins. And so at that time, we're going to be talking more about the last process here, talking about detoxification, because that definitely ties uh, into cancer and, and cancer risk. So let me just summarize for you. Um, we talked about the five key principles of a cancer prevention diet, number one being consume sufficient calories but not excessive calories. You know, go again with where your body is rather than your emotions and, um, you know, being bored. Really, if you need to eat, you know, um, really pay attention to the signals that you're getting. Number two, eat a colorful diet. We talked about the rainbow and all the goodness there from all the different colors. Eat, number three, eat a whole foods diet, so foods that are recognizable, uh, foods in their, their whole form, their natural form, things like legumes and fruits and vegetables. Number four, emphasize plant and marine sources of fat and protein. So we talked about the omega-3 fats versus the omega-6 fats. And then finally, uh, to reduce or eliminate refined, processed, and packaged foods. And by doing so, you're actually starting to eliminate lots of sugar. So uh, these are my books that, uh, that Harmony Hill carries. Uh, here's my website in, in case you'd like to get in touch with me to talk a little bit more about nutrition. And I'd like to um, open it up again for more questions. Hey, <clears throat> thanks, Deanna. Um, if you do have a question, just um, hit the raise your hand. I, I don't see any new hands up, but while we're waiting for you to Raise your hand if you have a question. I have a couple of questions based on what you've just gone through. Or um, You mentioned organic versus conventionally grown foods. And I know in an earlier session we were talking about um, the misperception that organic foods are more expensive than conventionally mm. grown foods. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? Well, one thing to keep in mind, there, there are some things around organic foods. Uh, first of all, just because they're organic uh, doesn't mean that they're not contaminated with herbicides, insecticides, and pesticides. In fact, there was a statistic that came out indicating that 30% of organically grown food is contaminated. 
so you also, and that's just through uh, distribution of the food and, and handling. So you want to be sure that you wash all of your produce very well. Um, one of the other benefits of organic food that I did not mention is that when the fruit or the vegetable or the grain is stressed in their environments because they're not being given things to ward off insects, they actually start to produce um, different compounds, and some of these compounds um, may be beneficial for humans. So you get an added benefit with organic food um, by having that additional kind of a second level of nutrition there. Now you're asking about is organic food necessarily um, more expensive? There are definitely some things that are more expensive. Um, it, it just kind of depends how you look at this because with organic food, yes, you are minimizing the toxin load. And number two, you might be getting some additional good nutrients in that, in that food that you might not have otherwise got with a conventionally grown piece of fruit or vegetable. So you're getting an added benefit there. And what I'm noticing is that a lot of uh, grocery stores are starting to carry much more moderately priced organic food. And the more you buy, the, the more that the, the price will come down overall. You know, that's just a, a basic law of um, supply and demand. So what I would say is to let's continue to support organically grown produce, um, also with the hope of driving the price down even further. So, I just Thanks. want to let you know we've got three questions. Um, yes, three hands. I, I was going to say, I see three okay. hands if you want to unblock. Un, um, I think we've heard from Eric and Sarah already, but Mary Ellen is a new hand. All right, I'll unmute Mary Ellen. Hi, Mary Ellen. Hi. Hi. Um, um, uh, are, you, are you getting me? Yes, we are. I'm hearing you. Yes. Oh, good. Um, you spoke about the balance between... Um, uh, the omega six and omega threes, I think. Yes. Yes. Um, and um, I would like to know um, how much you consider. Uh, well, I know that fat is supposed to be taken in small quantities, but just to give an idea of um, of intake on those. Could you speak to that, please? Well, that that's a very good question. Um, however, that's going to depend on a number of different things. So exam as an example, if you were a vegetarian, uh, I might be mentioning that, um, you know, you may not have a lot of the meat and the other products that would be more in the, on the favor of the inflammatory side. Right, so it, it really it's kind of a personalized approach, and what I would recommend if you're not sure where your body stacks up in terms of the amount of omega three versus the omega six level, is if you go to a healthcare practitioner, uh, especially like a naturopathic physician, they could take a blood sample and send it to the lab, and essentially will tell you straight away how much you have with respect to both of those. It's not about okay. the quantity. It's, it's Again, it's about the ratio between the two. Okay. And that is that um, just what's in the blood, or is it intracellular, intercellular analysis? No, what it's gets in the blood. The cells? It's in the, yeah, it's in the red blood cells. Um, so, in fact, I, I believe that there's even a test that you can go online uh, and do yourself. I believe it's called Omega Quant. Omega Quant. You might have to Google that to find the website. Um, I believe it's about $150 to do this test if you are interested. Okay. But it does it through the, the blood. I see. Okay. And the, there is a good correlation between the blood levels and tissue levels. Um, I know specifically about the heart um, because they, they have um, done correlation studies between heart levels, and that's important to note for cardiovascular disease, and then looking at the correlation with blood. Thank you very much, Deanna. Sure. Thanks for the question. So I'll move to, uh, to Eric. All right, Eric, hello. I already asked my question. I'm oh, sure okay. I'm all set. Okay. Thanks. All right. Great. 
Um, Deanna, one of the things, while we're waiting for another hand to go up, you mentioned with respect to canola oil that you do not want a GMO, and I wasn't sure if everyone online knew what a GMO meant, what that means. Oh, yes. Uh, yes, thank you for clarifying that. Uh, GMO refers to genetically modified organism. So uh, this essentially refers to the DNA of certain organisms, like another plant. Like let's just say that if we wanted to make a more hardy tomato, we might embed the DNA of a cotton plant uh, into that tomato plant to make it more robust. And, or that DNA from the cotton plant might bring in different features that could make the tomato plant stronger. But, of course, that's not natural, and it is genetically um, manipulated. And there's some question as to whether or not that's a good thing. Now, you might say, well, it's a good thing in terms of helping people to have more food or have less waste and have better food. Um, for example, um, in India, they had uh, there was a project where um, the rice was genetically engineered to contain certain nutrients that you would not normally get from rice. So you could say, well, that, that sounds like a very good thing. There are certain other opinions that believe that genetically modified foods um, might have long-term effects, and we just haven't seen the, the population studies extensively. We've seen a lot of animal studies. In fact, there's a wonderful book called Genetic Roulette by um, uh, Jeffrey Smith in which he details a number of animal studies showing a lot of reproductive toxicity um, and infertility in animals that were fed uh, high levels of GMO foods. So that, on, on my end, I, I think it's a little bit concerning, and I think if we can avoid them, I think that's a good thing until we get more data. Uh, but they're quite ubiquitous in our food supply. Pretty much 80 to 90 percent of the corn and soy that you buy in the grocery store is genetically modified, um, unless it's an organically grown or USDA organic product, in which case um, it's one of the criteria is to not be GMO if it's organic. So that's how you could um, avoid more GMOs. In Europe, in the European Union, they don't allow GMOs in their food supply. So it's it's up to you as a consumer what you choose. All I would say is be educated on the subject and uh, you know do lots of reading. Go to Jeffrey Smith's website and get a sampling of different opinions. Well, if that's not an argument for organic, I don't know what it is. <laughs> that's wonderful. <laughs> well, I think this um, conclu concludes our session at this point, Dan. Unless you have any other uh, concluding thoughts or comments. Um, I just want to thank everybody for being on the phone tonight, and uh, I like this idea of having the, the Q&A uh, in between so that we get these questions addressed. And, again, we're here to serve and to help you. Um, so this has been great, and I hope that we'll have all of you on our next week's webinar as well. Wonderful. Well, thank you, Deanna. You're so generous with your time. We are so grateful for you know, you being able to join us for these webinars. It's It's such a treat to spend time with you. And as again, a reminder to everybody, as you log off tonight, you're going to get a um, a survey, and it is anonymous feel, unless you put your name in it. So feel free to give us your feedback on what you thought about this evening's seminar and if you have any recommendations for us. So thank you for thank you, everybody. We'll see you next Sunday at six.